This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Tisha Manteith with the Neurology Podcast. I'm here to talk to you today about an update on cluster headache treatment options. With me to discuss is Matthew Robbins, an Associate Professor of Neurology at Cornell Medicine. Hi, Matt. How are you? Hi, Tisha. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to join you. Well, you know, you did all the hard work, you and your team, in writing about uh, guidelines for cluster headache. We certainly need them. Yes, I totally agree. It's a really dreadful condition, even when it's episodic or chronic. And I think, thankfully, there's been some advances, but still some stalwarts that we'll discuss that that are the mainstay for the practicing neurologist. Absolutely. Let's just start off with the best evidence for acute management of cluster headache. So there we have a number of options, um, and they're still pretty tried and true to what the guidelines that were published in 2016 summarized. So we have triptans, mainly ones that are not pills. You know, they have to be given in some more rapid onset formulation because cluster headache is such a dreadful and rapid headache disorder that the attacks don't last for as long as migraine for many, many hours. You know, they last anywhere from 15 minutes to up to three hours. So you have to give a non-oral treatment. So for the triptans, we have subcutaneous sumatriptan, which probably is still the most commonly used one. And we have intranasal zolmatriptan and also intranasal sumatriptan, which probably works almost as well as intranasal zolmatriptan. In the guidelines, zolmatriptan got a higher level of evidence. And then, of course, there's oxygen. And oxygen has to be administered in a certain way. It has to be high flow, typically 12 liters per minute or even more with a non-rebreather mask, not a nasal cannula or some other way. And then, you know, a more recent treatment that's been cleared by the FDA for acute treatment of cluster headache is vagus nerve stimulator external handheld device that seems to work for some patients with cluster headache, but in the evidence, it seems to only be effective for those with episodic cluster headache, uh, not with chronic cluster headache. What about the preventive treatment for cluster headache? Well, the preventive treatments are interesting based on what guidelines tell us, like what we did back in 2016, and also what is based on expert opinion. I think the most commonly used preventative treatment for cluster headache, even today, probably remains verapamil, a calcium channel blocker. Now, in our guideline, it didn't receive a very high level of evidence because there was really no high-quality clinical trial that showed that evidence assessment sense that the American Headache Society applied, which is based on American Academy of Neurology methodology. So in the guideline, it didn't receive a high rating, but with the acknowledgement that there just aren't studies that refute its evidence and certainly a comparative study that shows it's better than other treatments. Although we don't have great guideline evidence for cluster headache prevention in the long run, verapamil is probably what most experts think is the best. The only FDA-approved treatment for cluster headache prevention now is galcanazumab, which is a monoclonal antibody um, that targets CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide. Though similar to other treatments, it only showed efficacy as a preventative treatment in the one major clinical trial for episodic cluster headache and not for chronic cluster headache, which is a very you know, challenging condition to treat. If we can't use those treatments, obviously there's others that we go to. Lithium is one, sometimes certain anti-seizure medicines like topiramate, like gabapentin. That same vagus nerve stimulator external device is FDA cleared as an adjunctive preventative treatment for cluster headache, and that also might be a good option, sometimes melatonin and so on. But what I would say nowadays, probably verapamil and galcanazumab are what are used the most. We don't have any comparative studies to know which one is better. And any clinical pearls for, I would say, the acute management as well as the preventive management of cluster headache, things that neurologists should know that might optimize care? Using oral triptans, that's a pitfall that I see often in patients I might see in my own practice. Oxygen using sort of a nasal cannula or some other way um, is often what is, is done erroneously, so it really has to be a non-rebreather treatment. And I think in cluster headache, when you think about acute treatment and preventative treatment, really both have to be considered for every single patient. And that's been affirmed by quality measure set that the American Academy of Neurology and American Headache Society have done together. The default mode on cluster headache should always be what do you do acutely and what do you do preventatively? And only if the attack bout is going to be very short may you 
consider omitting a preventative treatment, but that often isn't the case. Typically, cluster headache is so awful and about for episodic cluster will still last for at least a couple of weeks that you generally have to do something for preventative treatment, even if it's a short-term preventative treatment. I know some things that I've seen is um, the benefit of pushing up verapamil, obviously being careful about hard block, but pushing up verapamil to very large doses may have some therapeutic benefit. Absolutely. We do that all the time. Sometimes for some reason, the short-acting verapamil can just be better than the sustained release verapamil, which has a more irregular release. So sometimes even keeping the same total dose but switching to the short-acting form can work. Absolutely what you're saying. Sometimes the doses required for verapamil are gigantic and always leads to us receiving concerned phone calls from pharmacists and other clinicians. But, you know, we have to acknowledge that cluster headache is so horrible that often it requires doses that are, are that high. And often patients with cluster headache tolerate these dose increases remarkably well for some reason, thankfully. And as you suggested, you have to do serial EKG monitoring when you do these very high dose escalations past 240 milligrams per day. And what is the typical dose for melatonin? The range can be quite broad, you know, anywhere from three milligrams to 18 milligrams every evening. Typically, melatonin isn't done by itself. It's often sort of a supplemental preventative treatment, but that's sort of the dose range that has been reported. What about the bridging therapies? What what are some of your strategies? Bridging therapies are often needed for most patients. And bridging, people sometimes refer to it as a short-term preventative treatment too. There's two main ones that are used in clinical practice. One is an oral steroid, typically prednisone. And thankfully, there's been a recent European clinical trial that has shown that it can be very effective as an adjunctive preventative treatment to verapamil starting. And often doses have to start as high as 100 milligrams and then rapidly taper after five to seven days. Typically, Typically, the treatment period for oral steroid is over two to three weeks in that general range. An alternative to that is a single or repeated greater occipital nerve injection with a steroid also on the side of where the headache is experienced. Which one is better? You know, we're not sure. We did a comparative study that showed perhaps oral steroids were better, but of course, that's a biased study as a retrospective comparative study. But likely the greater occipital nerve injection treatment has just fewer systemic side effects, of course, but certainly both have great levels of evidence. In fact, in the American Headache Society guideline, the occipital nerve injection with steroid received level A evidence. So really, we should use that with payers, insurance companies, and others to to justify using that treatment for cluster headache. Speaking of blocks, what about the sphenopalatine ganglion blocks for cluster headache? The sphenopalatine or ganglion SPG blocks, you know, it's a appealing anatomic target because that's where the autonomic parasympathetic traffic goes to the upper part of the face. And we know in cluster headache is a trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia, so it's a appealing place to block it. I haven't seen it work great, to tell you the truth, using these blocks. This can be done using intranasal Q-tip with a local anesthetic. It can be done with different catheter-type devices. There's not very much evidence at all for doing it percutaneously with, say, an interventionalist or neuroradiologist through the cheek using CT guidance, for example. But I have used that in patients because of how appealing it is for a treatment and those who are otherwise refractory to other treatments. So I think it's an appealing target, but it hasn't materialized with a level of evidence that has been suggested that it should be in routine clinical practice. But on the other hand, the sphenopalatine ganglion is a target for neurostimulation, neuromodulation. And there's very good evidence that doing an implanted neurostimulator to that area can be an extremely effective treatment for cluster headache for both acute treatments in a randomized trial and likely as a preventative treatment in the long run in longer observational studies. But this is generally not something that's done in the United States uh, very often, but it's something that we're all looking to because it also showed effectiveness in chronic cluster headache, which is pretty uncommon to find in clinical trials. Speaking of chronic cluster headache, what are some of your strategies for chronic cluster headache? Yeah, it's a tough one, Tisha, because the evidence is not as great for many of the treatments as we discussed. Fortunately, for most of the acute treatments, it's still, you know, oxygen, subcutaneous, sumatriptan, even zolmatriptan to some extent, intranasal can be very effective. But for preventative treatments, it's very challenging. You know, often we use what works for episodic cluster headache in different doses, combination treatments. And sometimes we have to consider more invasive treatments such as neuro modulation, you know, that could be occipital nerve stimulation. You know, there's some experience with deep brain stimulation of the posterior hypothalamus. There's a recent report that I read using focused ultrasound for chronic cluster headache management. So I think sometimes we have to think about these treatments. Regarding galcanazumab, the CGRP monoclonal antibody, there's some 
sort of observational evidence that it might work as a long-term preventative treatment using the 300 milligram cluster headache dose in the long run. There have been no safety concerns that have so far arisen. And I have done that in patients because the evidence for chronic cluster headache treatment, even if the randomized clinical control trial for it at a certain more short-term interval didn't show efficacy over placebo, it could be that it just takes a very long time in chronic cluster headache to show some tangible difference. And I know there are a number of therapeutics under investigation for treatment of cluster headache, psilocybin, for example. Where, where are we with these products? Yeah, psilocybin, a certain type of serotonin you know, receptor antagonist, I think is very appealing. Um, we've had very limited evidence, but some that have shown potentially that there could be some patients who respond to that was just published in recent months. So that's something that we're looking to more for, especially chronic cluster headache, which is just such a particularly dreadful condition. So hopefully more work out of that experience and more flexibility for study, for research of this type of treatment will be done. So we're, we're all looking forward to seeing how that goes. There was a recent paper published in Neurology on cluster headache and the burden of multiple morbidity. And so I think it makes us think a little bit about multidisciplinary care for cluster headaches, similar to maybe for migraine. Any advice or pearls in that area? Cluster headache, especially episodic cluster headache, which, you know, about 90% of people with cluster headache have, we think of it so situationally. You know, people either have it, they're in a bout, or they're not in a very binary way. So often multidisciplinary care is not really thought of the way we do for migraine, where there's this more perpetual vulnerability and attacks can just kind of happen at random no matter when and where people are. So I think certain conditions that are more prevalent in cluster headache remain the logical ones to address, like cigarette smoking, like sleep disorders, especially given cluster headaches association with nocturnal attacks. It seems reasonable to really screen those patients in particular for obstructive sleep apnea to see if that would be even a trigger for cluster headache attacks. And maybe its treatment would also have an indirect impact on cluster headache as well. Any final thoughts about the management of cluster headache? I think we've come a long way. We've got great newer treatments that have come around, and also our old treatments that we've been using also have sort of reinforced clinical experience. And I think sort of an evolution of where we are with these treatments in terms of the sequencing of these treatments. But I think we have more tools than we ever have had before. And you know, I would still just recommend that everyone always think about acute and preventative treatment simultaneously for every patient with cluster headache. Great. Well, I think that was a high yield conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tisha. Great to be here. And thank you for listening to the Neurology Podcast. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. Thank you for listening and for letting us join you on your commute while you're exercising or even while you're brushing your teeth. This has been another episode of the Neurology Podcast, your best source of practical, relevant, and timely information for neurologists, clinicians, and patients. The views and opinions of the participants in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the journal Neurology or the AAN. Disclosures of the participants are included in the show descriptions reached by a link on the neurology.org website.